Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Jim Ninsel, host of AZ Illustrated Politics, our weekly commentary and analysis on local, state, and national politics. On tonight's show, Republican House leaders say they will not be tackling immigration reform in 2013. Is there any reason to hope that 2014 will be any different? Plus, the Tucson City Council adopts new policies on the enforcement of SB 1070, and Senator John McCain plays a key role in pushing a bill to prohibit employment discrimination against gays and lesbians through the U.S. Senate. That's all coming up on AZ Illustrated Politics, but first, a look at today's top stories. Two Arizona Democrats crossed the political aisle today to vote with congressional Republicans to pass a bill dealing with canceled insurance coverage due to the Affordable Care Act. Representatives Ron Barber and Kirsten Sinema both voted with majority Republicans for the bill. Arizona Democrats Raul Grijalva and Kirkpatrick and Ed Pastor all voted against the bill. All of Arizona's congressional Republicans voted for the proposal, except Paul Gosar, who did not register a vote. The bill still must be approved by the Democratic-dominated U.S. Senate. The White House has promised to veto the proposal. The mother of one of the 19 Granite Mountain firefighters killed in the Yarnell Hill fire has filed a civil suit against the city of Prescott, state of Arizona, and Yavapai County. According to the Daily Courier newspaper in Prescott, the suit seeks $36 million, a third from each of the three governments, though the woman says she is willing to settle in 60 days for $12 million. The suit maintains the government's violated nationally recognized firefighting orders. And this weekend, the state of Arizona will release 30 bighorn sheep in the Catalina Mountains. The sheep are native to the area, but haven't been seen in years, so the state's trying to regrow the population. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. The House of Representatives defied President Obama today, voting to let health insurers keep selling policies that don't meet the standards of the Affordable Care Act to both current and new customers. Another in our series of personal stories about the health care law's impact. Tonight, an aspiring chef in California turns to Medicaid. All I know is that that option is the best one for me at this point. And it's Friday. Mark Shields and David Brooks are here to analyze the week's news. Those are just some of the stories we're covering on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Tonight, Arizona Week looks at health care and the current progress of the Affordable Care Act. How are the Medicaid expansion and insurance exchanges affecting Arizonans? And what does this mean for our state's economy? That's tonight at 830 on PBS 6. This week, House Speaker John Boehner said there wasn't enough time left on the congressional calendar to deal with comprehensive immigration reform and told the press that he had no intention of ever negotiating with the Senate on the bipartisan Gang of Eight immigration bill that passed earlier this year. Here to talk about what this means for immigration reform is Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce President Leah Marquez-Peterson, Attorney Jeff Rogers, the former chairman of the Pima County Democratic Party, and Attorney Vince Robigo, chairman of the Pima County Latino Democratic Caucus. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Leah, you were back in D.C. just a few weeks ago to lobby congressional members on the immigration reform package. What do you see as the hold? What are Republicans telling you is the hold up on, on their end on, on getting some kind of package passed? You know, it was interesting. I traveled with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and about 20 different delegates from the state of Arizona uh, representing the business community, faith-based leaders, the law enforcement community. So we came with that particular voice, that particular message to meet with the entire Arizona House delegation. And, you know, I'm disappointed to hear Speaker Boehner's uh, comments uh, that you mentioned in your, in your intro. We left feeling a bit hopeful. We understood that the timeline was incredibly tight. Um, it, very complex issues. So I think kind of in summary, because I don't think we have enough time here to even go through all the different details that I think we uncovered, was that there there is no real consensus. There's so many issues that are really the line in the sand, depending on the different congressperson that you speak with. Um, we asked particularly about certain committees and different bills or, or components of that that might move forward through the committees and felt heard some very encouraging things. We're really looking for bipartisan action um, on the behalf of the Republicans on some of these different components. And 
left hopeful. I mean, here we are a couple weeks later, and to hear comments like that, that is disappointing. So we need to continue to advocate. It's important that the business community, faith-based and law enforcement, and, and all other constituency groups head back to D.C. and continue to have that dialogue with our Congress people. Jeff, it does become harder in an election year, and it seems like path to citizenship is, is one of the major deal breakers here. Well, right now there are the votes to pass this. I, I mean, this is, can truly be laid at the foot of John Boehner. Uh, the fact that he won't call it up for a vote, there are over 28 uh, um, Republican congressmen and women who have indicated that they support a path to citizenship. And you add that to the 200 Democrats, you're over the hurdle, that's it. But, you know, he's being held hostage by uh, of, of the Tea Party group of about 30, what they're calling the hell no Republicans. And these, these people are absolutely opposed to any kind of path to citizenship. Many of them are opposed to even any kind of regularization of, of the status of, of the people that are here. So what we've got is we've got 13 legislative work days left in the session from today on with Thanksgiving vacation and Christmas vacation. So the realistically, it, it isn't going to happen. And it's certainly not going to happen in an election year. I mean, we saw this so-called so autopsy done after the last election by the Republican Party, and they said they needed to reach out to, to Latinos and to change the look of this party and change the face of it. And, uh, and what we're seeing now is that individual Republicans are being selfish in their own interest. They're looking at, well, I don't need to do anything about immigration to get reelected in my district. In fact, if I do anything, uh, I, I could get attacked from the right and primary by somebody even more conservative. So in fact, what they're doing is not in the interest of our country. It's not even in the interest, long-term interest of the Republican Party, but it they're being selfish with their own individual interests and, uh, and, and setting aside the interests of the country. So I'm very, very disappointed. I don't think we have any chance until 2015, and that is going to de be dependent on what happens next November and electing more Democrats so that there's a chance for reform. And Vince, uh, we're seeing some of that uh, failure to address the question coming down here at the local level. The Tucson City Council this week voted to change some policies regarding SB 1070 and the police enforcement of that controversial immigration law, including, I think, uh, not allowing uh, minors to be questioned unless they have an attorney or their parent present and uh, not checking the immigration status of passengers who might be in the car or witnesses who come forward if there's been a crime committed. Uh, your thoughts on what's going on here with the Tucson City Council? Well, I think it is uh, in part uh, a, a reflection of sort of the blowback of this extreme uh, anti-immigrant uh, policies that have been pushed by folks like Russell Pierce, uh, who later got recalled and, and was the champion of Senate Bill 1070. And that sort of, I think, kind of cements what Jeff was saying uh, about the politics and, and how this may come back, and I believe will come back to haunt, uh, haunt uh, the Republicans, particularly the leadership and the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party. So here in Tucson, uh, what you see is that when the Supreme Court ruled on Senate Bill 1070, found the heart of it largely to be unconstitutional because it's the state trying to enforce a federal uh, concern. Um, and, and there were some parts that were not decided by the U.S. Supreme Court, namely the, the sort of papers please uh, portion of the law. And so what the Supreme Court said was uh, that issue is not ripe. We need more facts that can be raised again in a different case. Um, and so what you're seeing is enforcement efforts at the local level across the state of Arizona, um, certainly in South Tucson, and you see people that are, are raising these issues, citizens, sometimes Dream Act students, sometimes immigrants without papers that are saying that they are being harassed or asked for papers when there's no cause to be approached by the police. And so uh, based on these various incidents that have been reported, the Tucson City Council said we need to have a policy that is uh, not uh, essentially harassing our citizens. And, and so those are some of the issues that you uh, raised and, and it's a reflection of our community here is one that values the people that are here. Um, we certainly want to comply with the law, but when you have a law like Senate Bill 1070, the reality is, is the, is the police can use that, and I'm not blaming any particular police officer because I support police officers, I support law enforcement, work with law enforcement for many years, but when you have a law that is trying to accomplish what really the federal government should be doing, the discretion breaks down. And it's very easy for the police officers just to stop somebody and think, oh, I have to take the next step. I need to call Border Patrol. I need to really find out if this person's here lawfully. When really we have murders, we have rapes, we have burglaries occurring. 
things that our taxpayer dollars should be spent on. So what the city uh, was doing, mayor and council, was trying to give additional guidance on the issue of juveniles, for example, and also just the question of whether or not we, we inquire uh, of, of your status, of your legal status, when really that may have nothing to do with a traffic ticket. And, right. and, and there's, there's one other aspect to that, that that's real important, and you touched on it a little bit here, but, you know, what we're seeing is people who are afraid to call the police. And, 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 and people here who are undocumented, they, let's take a domestic violence victim uh, who calls, uh, who's thinking, I don't want to be subject to domestic violence, uh, but on the other hand, I don't want to see my husband deported, and I don't want to be deported. And so, you know, you've got that, and you've got witnesses to very serious crimes who, who are, are, don't want to come forward. They see a serious crime, and they think, well, I'm not going to wait around here for the police. They're going to question my, my immigration status. And so what we're seeing is a rift between the community and the police department that shouldn't be there. And, 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 and to give all credit to, to Chief Villasenor, he, he knew this would happen from the very beginning. And he, and he was opposed to it, as were a lot of other law enforcement officers, because they can see this rift. They need victims to report crimes, and they need witnesses to report crimes, and they need it to be available for prosecution at a later date. And so, you know, this, and the impetus for all this came from Councilwoman Romero, who's been dogged on this issue since, since Senate Bill 1070 passed, and she was the one who moved the item that, that, that also requires them to create a data, stop data collection basis, it requires them to have a community outreach program, and it requires them to not ask for the, the immigration status of anyone who reports police misconduct of any kind because, after all, you would chill the, the, the reporting of such things and to focus on the, 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 the suspects in an investigation and not on the immigration status of witnesses and victims. So I, I applaud the council for, for taking this, this direction and, and I think that they can work with the police department to do this right and respect the sort of dignity and constitutional rights of people in this town. Leo, what are your thoughts on what the City Council did there? You know, I, I applaud the City Council for taking on this issue and, and Councilman Romero for speaking up on this, on this important issue because we've been on the show in prior weeks where we've talked about the protests and the concerns that this could escalate to violence. And I think the Tucson Police Department was in a tough spot. We've heard Chief Yosinod speak about this for the last several years since SB 1070 passed. And the fact that this uh, this law, this the enforcement of the law is really uh, determined or translated or interpreted in by different jurisdictions in a different way. That that's not something that that works. Um, so I think the fact that they've stepped forward makes sense to make some different practical changes. Um, but SB 1070 is still the law. So I think if people are stopped for particular traffic violations and are asked for identification, I think you know we still need to support the law as it's been stated until anything changes. And uh, Vince, the U.S. Senate last week passed the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which would prohibit discrimination on the basis of uh, sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, Senator John McCain uh, and Jeff Flake both voted with the Democrats on this particular bit of legislation, and John McCain was someone who came forward with an amendment to exempt some religious uh, groups from the uh, from the regulations. Uh, were you surprised to see Arizona senators voting in favor of this? No, I think uh, they are voting with the, the times and voting with how people view this issue. And, and simply put, there's no reason for discrimination in the workplace. I understand with certain religious organizations, there may be different carve-outs because you have those sorts of carve-outs in other areas as well with religious organizations in terms of their practices because you have religious beliefs and First Amendment issues there. But by and large, um, the real issue is going to be what's, what's going to happen next, what's going to happen in the House of Representatives. You're already hearing, I think, some of the candidates in, in uh, CD2 saying they don't know why this law is necessary. But, but the American people, people here in Arizona, uh, believe that you should not be discriminated against in the workplace for any reason. So I applaud uh, the senators for, for taking that step uh, and, and supporting uh, this bill. The real question is what's going to happen with the House leadership, the GOP leadership in the House. And have already indicated they're not uh, in support of this. But, Leah, uh, let me ask you, there's the concern a lot of people raise about this law is a worry about frivolous lawsuits as a result of it. And, uh, you work with the business community a lot. Are, are you hearing those kinds of concerns? I, I'm not hearing those kind of concerns. And I, I saw Senator McCain and Flake step out on this issue. Um, and it is controversial. But I think Vince is right in the fact that it's, it's something that makes sense in this day and age. And I think the protections are needed. And... Uh, 
We talked last week about uh, Congressional District 2 on this program. Uh, Congressman Ron Barber is facing a tough re-election race next year. We now have three candidates on the Republican side in that. Uh, Shelley Case is making her political debut with a run for the uh, seat. Do you have any uh, sense of how the dynamics of that race are starting to play out here? No, I'm sure that this is certainly creating um, some challenges within that primary race. I don't know Miss Case. Um, I did get on her website, take a look. I mean, business ownership experience, that's always quite a positive from a chamber perspective. But it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the election cycle. And Jeff uh, Shelley Kais is a, a, a political rookie. Uh, we haven't seen her before in this arena. And uh, there's Ed Martin, who is also a talk show host and was involved in New York politics before moving to Arizona, wants to run in this race. And they're both going to try to un uh, take down Martha McSally, who's the clear favorite. Uh, McSally raised, I think, more than any other congressional candidate in the third quarter, or any other congressional candidate in the state in the third quarter, and uh, nearly unseated Barber last time. Uh, there's concern from the Ed Martin saying that uh, Shelley Kais might be a plant from the uh, from the McSally campaign uh, to help cut into his vote. Uh, she denies uh, doing anything like that. Your your thoughts on how this is shaping up? You know, it, it, it's awfully hard to plant a climb to uh, somebody in a, in a in a race like that. I mean, we we saw that happen to when the Russell Pierce recall race, where there clearly was a plant in there from the re, from the Pierce people to try to to to. Uh, 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 affect that race, and I, I I don't see that very often. I, I'd frankly be uh, you know a little skeptical that anything like that is happening, and uh, and, and it's a mixed bag. Who does she affect most? I mean, we, earlier we were speaking before the show, and Vince thought maybe she could she could cut into the Ed Martin vote because you've got the known person McSally, and you've got the uh, two unknowns running in the race, and maybe they, they cut into that. But there's been a lot of accusations from a lot of the more conservative element of the Republican Party that she's not the genuine article. And so I, I have to wonder, is, you know, could, could it work the other way around? But she's awfully well funded. But, you know, I, my, my, my statement to her is the same as it always is. Come out of your bunker and tell us where you, where you are on these issues. For instance, where are you on the Employment Non-Discrimination Act? Do you know that 80% that of the people in America in a recent poll said that they supported that? And do you know that since 1996, we've tried to pass something like that in the Arizona legislature, and it has only once did it ever make it to a vote. And guess what? You know, I, I, she seems to not understand that this is a problem. Well, I can tell you that a private business right now could put a sign in the window that says, help wanted, gays need not apply. Or an employer can come, come, come in one morning from work and say, Jim, I, I found out you're gay. You're fired because of that. I mean, that can happen right now in over half the states in America and, and in Arizona. And that's exactly why we need a bill like this. And I'd also like to hear how all of these Republicans feel about uh, uh, gay marriage and some of these other hot button issues that are important. And they refuse to answer questions. I haven't studied that. I need more information. I haven't read that bill. These seems to be the answers that we've been getting out of McSally, you know, ever since she first stepped foot back in Arizona when the, the opening occurred. And uh, I think we're you're going to see more and more and more of that. And, and no matter how dogged you are or other members of the press, they seem to just, just get away with not answering the questions. I, I spoke with all three of the candidates in the CD2 race about ENDA, the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, and all three of them said that while they don't like the idea of discrimination, they don't see the need, they don't understand why this isn't already covered under state or federal law. And then, as Jeff was saying, Vince, it's not currently it, covered. It, it's not covered. And, and so that is a, it is an issue. It is something that, that uh, needs to get past as far as whether that's going to play an issue in, in the race that's coming up the primary you were just speaking about uh, you know and in terms of this new candidate that you mentioned I, I I don't believe that that she's a plant but I do believe that this ultimately will help McSally at the end of the day because uh, Martha McSally ran two races they were well funded there was a lot of publicity so she raised her name ID way up and when you have two lesser known uh, candidates that are running trying to run they're gonna and they stay if they stay in the race the one with the most name ID will likely win. And speaking of Ron Barber, uh, just this week uh, there was a vote on the uh, health care law and, and changing uh, the individual mandate, and Ron Barber once again crossed party lines to vote with the Republicans on this. This is something that he's gotten into a lot of trouble with local Democrats with in the past. Uh, Jeff, is this going to once again raise the hackles of the activist wing of the, of the Democratic Party, and, and is there a possibility of a primary challenge emerging? 
I don't see a primary challenge, but I do see that, that it, it's upsetting the base and he may see a lot less interest in his race, both financially and uh, uh, from amount of, from the, you know, the sort of grassroots workers, the people who knock on doors and make phone calls and stuff envelopes and do the hard work that gets people elected. I mean, just today it appears that he has voted with the Republicans, one of just a few Democrats who voted with the Republicans, to basically uh, allow these companies to continue selling these junk, meaningless policies to people people and that, that offer really no protection and, uh, and endlessly. Now, now, President Obama has said, well, I'll, uh, I will consider, you know, allowing people to do this for one more year while we get our sea legs on the Obamacare, but, you know, you can't say you're going to do it forever and, because that, that undercuts the, the, in, in the entire process. I mean, this is like a four-legged stool when you consider the Medicare expansion, the individual mandate, the getting rid of the junk policies and, and having some minimum standard that, that the insurance policies have to meet, and then the employer mandate, which has been delayed a year. These are all parts of a plan that, that if you pull one leg out from under it, the stool is going to fall apart. And so it's playing into the Republicans' plan to dismantle the Affordable Care Act. And so I would urge him not to vote in such a manner. And Vince, it has been a disastrous rollout of the, uh, of the marketplace for the sale of these individual insurance policies. It has. It had, the rollout uh, certainly uh, left much, much to be uh, desired. Um, I was thinking back about that, and uh, you know, I just don't, I don't believe they were ready for it. I think the website, the same thing, it's been the biggest internet uh, website rollout of any sort of major interactive program probably in the history of, of mankind, and they weren't ready for it. Um, as far as, as what's happening here, though, in terms of the political context, um, one issue I think that folks like, like Congressman Barber and, and others that are voting on these issues what I think sometimes is not uh, seeping into the picture when they're making these decisions is that for years, while, while the government and, and Republicans and Democrats could have been working to make sure this was a smooth rollout, what you had instead was a dogged determination to kill it, kill it, kill it, even after it had been voted on, uh, approved by the president, went through the court system, was approved, yet you, you know, how many, like 40, I don't know how many votes to just kill or defund uh, the Affordable Care Act have occurred, rather than trying to work with our system to make sure this was a good rollout. So when, when people are voting to try to like, well, let's fix this, but they are really undercutting a major component, you have to look at the bigger overall political picture that's happening. And, and so that's one thing I think uh, folks really need to step back and look, what has happened? Where are we? Are these <coughs> legitimate efforts to really fix issues that are coming along with the rollout or with these junk policies that are out there already or is this really just sort of falling into the to this repeated effort to try to kill or defund or you know disengage the Affordable Care Act. Leo, what are you hearing from the business community since this rollout happened? You know Congressman Barber represents a district that is pretty split Republican and Democratic so I am happy and I, I know a lot of my members are very uh, appreciative when he steps beyond the political talk and gets into what's a practical solution for our country. In this case Ro the rollout has been a mess. Um, in our case of small businesses and businesses that are considering what they do next, there's so much uncertainty. Uncertainty is not good for the business community when we're trying to determine whether we invest in what we do next. Um, you have a series of people, a lot of people, who receive letters for cancellation of insurance. I mean, there's a little bit of chaos in that. They're, they're concerned, they're not sure. Though they might not be the great, greatest policy, might be a major medical type policy uh, or something of that sort. We need them to have time in order to find an alternative. And I think the vote that he, he made, as well as Congresswoman Sinema and others, supported giving them additional time. And I think that's practical. That makes sense. So how this plays out and, and the backlash, perhaps, from the local Democratic Party and, and others, I think we need to look beyond that and, and make sure that we're, we have something that is, is going to work for all of us in the future. Congressman Barber also this week uh, sent a letter to the Pentagon uh, saying that he wants to see the support for the A-10 continue. The good move on Barber's part? You know, it's interesting. When I went to Washington, D.C. recently, I, I got a chance to go to the Pentagon and meet with some different leaders and talk about our Hispanic Chamber support of davis Monthan Air Force Base and uh, the F-35 and some of the different things that are going on that have been a bit controversial in our community. I think it's interesting to see Congressman Barber and, and others, and I, I believe it was a Republican senator that also stepped forward to write a letter and get 30-some uh, congressmen on the, on the letter that talked about the fact that they support the A-10 and the continuation of the A-10. That makes sense. If this is a, a plane that uh, can make, have financial implication on the military as we go through different financial challenges or budget cuts. Um, I think that that's a good move. 
Yeah. Well, the, the, the more important thing is that, that this is a very unique aircraft. Um, it, it is the only fixed wing close ground air support craft that we have like this. And uh, it has been known to, to take a licking and keep on ticking. I mean, it gets, it, it, it gets shot at lots and lots, and it's hovering in over the field to protect individual service members who are on the ground. We don't have anything quite like this, and certainly the F-35 is not. This thing can fly at very low altitudes at very slow speeds and, and provide ground cover for people who are you know on the ground. And so, you know, it's a very unique aircraft, and, and I, I don't see that the Pentagon seems to have something else up their sleeve and they just put new avionics and electronics in this aircraft as well as new re replace the wings on all of the ones at Davis Monthan and, and uh, you know they, so that they project that they can use these through 2028 and so this is a program that ought to be left in place and and I, I just you know I think you know part of this goes back to the sequester and we need to ask people like Martha McSally and Ed Martin and and Shelley Case do you support the sequester because this is a result of the sequester that we're having to just take a meat cleaver and lop things off here and there and this is one of them. Another one is 600 jobs at Lockheed Martin in, uh, in, in Goodyear, Arizona was just announced the other day that because of the sequester we're going to lose 600 jobs there. Um, so, you know, it, 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 you know we need to, to, to kick back and say, wait a minute here, this sequester is bad. It's bad for America. It's bad for in a lot of respects. And, and we have enough business leaders that ought to come forward and say, look, you know, speaking of uncertainty, a whole lot of military contractors have a tremendous amount of uncertainty because of this sequester and the kinds of cuts that are coming, you know, willy-nilly that aren't being thought out entirely. Mm -hmm. Leah, your thoughts on the sequester? I agree. I mean, certainly, I think you're right. The uncertainty it creates, the challenges that I think even Davis Monthan has faced in terms of what changes they make within, internally within their budget, um, it's something we need to, to not have. All right, we're down to our last two minutes. Uh, Vince, petitions were turned in this week to recall two members of the Sunnyside School District. Well, what's behind the dissatisfaction here over in Sunnyside? Well, you certainly have uh, folks that uh, were very displeased with uh, the sort of scandals that, that were coming out with respect to the superintendent and, and his, you know, the bankruptcy, and there were some other issues with uh, charge cards. And, and so then you had uh, you know, people that voted to renew the contract, and there were people that were unhappy with that decision. So uh, what has happened is you kind of have a split. Uh, you know, I have two folks that, that are now, I guess, the subject of a recall uh, that uh, were the filed uh, today, I believe. And uh, as a result of that effort, then supporters of those two gentlemen then decided to recall two other members. And so those aren't due to be turned in for several weeks. And then what happens that when you start a recall process, that's, the, the, that's very typical when you see that in small towns, city councils. Somebody starts a recall process and then the supporters of that person say, well, we're going to recall the other people. So that's, it's not good for the board. It's not good for the, for the students there at Sunnyside to have this sort of acrimony. Uh, but at the end of the day, if these, uh, there are enough, if enough signatures to go forward, you're going to have the voters that are going to get to decide ultimately. Leah, your thoughts on what's happening over there? That, that is dysfunctional. That is not good. I mean, that ultimately affects the children. Sunnyside's override failed because of lack of faith in the school district. Um, and, and we've heard Dr. Schietto and others talking about particular school closures and cuts they're going to have to take because the override didn't work out. Um, I think they need to do some board retreats or team bonding over there because something's not working quite right. Yeah, it sounds <laughs> fairly dysfunctional. And yeah, you, as you mentioned, school closures. We are out of time, Jeff. So uh, I'd like to thank all three of you for joining me today. And we will be right back with some closing thoughts. That's our show for today, but you can learn more about politics by visiting azpm.org or by following us on Facebook and Twitter. I'm Jim Ninsel. Thanks for watching another edition of AZ Illustrated Politics.